Let's look at Hebrews this morning. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, we're going to start at verse 5. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, this is an Old Testament quote, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, another Old Testament quote, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews is a very deep theological book, and so there's a lot going on here that we won't have time to get into today. But one of the things that this passage really focuses on is how Jesus was was a fully human being. A main point in this passage is that Jesus is fully human, just like us. It talks about angels, and I think one of the questions that was behind this is that, okay, if, if Jesus is, is the Lord, and he's greater than angels, then if he became human, then how, is he, then how is he still greater than angels if he became lower than the angels, if he became one of us? And so that's kind of what he was saying, and the, kind of the point of the passage here is that, well, even though Jesus was one of us, because of what he did, he is now raised higher than any angel. Uh, just because he was God, we, we talk about how Jesus is God a lot, but just because he was God doesn't mean that he was like some sort of Superman who was just way beyond us, somebody who we can't look up to, like, oh, well, that was Jesus, I could never do that. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. He's, he's our example. He's the one that we look up to and are supposed to emulate. Look at verse 9 here. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So yes, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, but now he's crowned with glory and honor because he had this mission of suffering death. Look at 11 and 12, where it says he calls us brothers. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. So he is one of us. He's, he's part of our family. He's shared in our humanity. Another verse that hits on this is verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. And then verse 17. I think this really hits at home most. He had to be made like his brothers in every way. Made like his brothers in every way. So if 
he was human, fully human, just like the rest of us, then if we have it, then he has it. And later, and later in chapter 4, it says that same phrase, that he was exactly like us in every way, and then it adds, but was without sin. But here it doesn't say that. Not because, not because it's, that, that part isn't important, but it's saying that this part right here is saying, you know, he was like us. He was like us. He knows what it's like. We can emulate him. So the point at this part of this passage here is that, no, he was like us. He knows what it means to be a human being. Jesus Christ was fully human. He was human enough to die. So just like each one of us, we're looking at death someday, unless Jesus comes again, which would be amazing. But each one of us are are looking at death, and each one of us has had to deal with death in one form or another. And that's a very big reality for us. But Jesus even shared in that. He knows what it's like to have to walk on this earth and think, it's one day that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass away. And he didn't die, sort of. This is something that I want to drive home today. He didn't kind of die. He didn't sort of die. He didn't die in a manner of speaking. No, he actually died. He died. In every sense of the word. Look at the uh, screen here with me if you would. Why did Christ have to go all the way to death? Because God's justice and truth demand it. Only the death of God's Son could pay for our sin. And the next one, why was he buried? His burial testifies that he really died. So it wasn't like he just passed out and then woke up. It wasn't like he was just in a coma and then came to his senses later. No, he was thrown in the ground. He was pronounced dead. He wasn't... He didn't just die. He was even buried. So even as all of us are looking at the possibility of being buried someday, he was buried too. He knows what it's like. And again, he didn't sort of die. He was dead as a doornail. He was gone. Now, there are skeptics who say, man, maybe Jesus didn't actually die. Maybe he just lost consciousness. No, he died. He expired. He passed away. He passed on. He was deceased, croaked. He was all that. Whatever you want. He was dead in every sense of the word. He didn't just have one foot in the grave. He dove in with both feet. We can, he knows what it's like. He can identify with us. And his human body went through the typical process of death. So what happens when you die? Your lungs stop breathing. You stop breathing in. Your, heart's, your heart stops beating. His heart stopped beating. His muscles would have lost tension and his body would have completely hung limp. All of his brain waves would have been gone. And you can only, we can barely even imagine what his body would have been like because he was already beaten and flogged and crucified, but then after that, the Lord's body entered the deterioration of death. I was looking into this this week. In fact, I was checking, out, checking it out quite a bit because I'm not a scientist um, and I'm not a mortician either. But death is a really awful, awful process. It's really, it's really disgusting. It's really revolting. And it's one thing to think, okay, that's going to happen to me someday, but to think that, no, this happened to 
our Lord and Savior. Decomposition starts actually very shortly after death. When your heart stops beating and your blood's not traveling through your veins anymore, you're, you're the, the bacteria that's in our bodies that starts to, starts to go to work. Now, I do want to say one thing here, especially those of you who, who know your Bible pretty well. The Bible has some pretty hard passages saying that his body didn't decay. Well, the Bible is big on that. And we can definitely say that his body didn't fully decay because he was only dead for, I don't know, somewhere around maybe 36 hours-ish. But for that amount of time, his body would have gone through any normal process of death because he didn't sort of die. No, he was even buried. And so... Right after, right after our body expires, uh, he would have gone through all those normal processes. His body would have been just like any of ours. So he didn't fully decay, but the decay would have started. And I'm not going to go into all the details of what happens, but it's, it's really awful. It's, it's really amazing to think that the person I call Lord and Savior went through all of this. So his, his complexion would have turned pale and even blue and purple. His, his skin would have turned cold after just a few moments. And as it was taken down from the cross, um, he, would have, he would have rigor mortis would have started to set in. And when your body turns stiff, in fact, um, that, that starts pretty close to right away. In about 8 to 12 hours after a person dies, the body is completely stiff. So he, he would have entered into full rigor mortis. If you want to know more, look it up. It's really unpleasant. And his, he would have gone through that. The one that we call Lord and Savior. And just thinking about how unpleasant death is and that our Lord and Savior went through this, this is, this is totally against anything that we would come up with. Counterintuitive to any human thinking the author of salvation had to die a sinful human's death. This, this part in verse 10, where it says, the author of their salvation. This is, this is kind of a, a, a unique word in, in Greek. It can mean like, different translations have it like captain, founder, pioneer, leader. He was the leader of our salvation. He's the one who blazed that trail of salvation for us. So we couldn't walk that. So our, our leader, our leader went through this to defeat death. So let's say, let's say we had to come up with a plan to defeat death. Okay, we have, we have this problem. We're all going to die. We're all sinners and we're separated from God. So how, how are we going to fix that? Now, if we had to come up with some sort of plan, we'd, we'd probably have Jesus come down and, and be one of us. We kind of like that. And then, but, then, but then if we had to defeat death, then maybe he just never dies. That, that would make more sense to us, wouldn't it? Let's say he comes down and he's one of us and he doesn't die. Let's say they try to kill him and they can't. They can't. His body is just invincible. And there's nothing they can do to kill him. And he just, he just keeps on living. Let's say, let's say he, he lives for 2,000 years. And anybody else who follows him and loves him, they can keep on living too. I mean, that'd be the way to defeat death, wouldn't it? If we had to come up with a plan, wouldn't that be the way to defeat death? Hey, our Lord and Savior, he never died. Whoa. 
I want, I want to follow him. He's not dying. That, that, that'd be our way. But that, that's, not, that's not God's way. The reality is the author of life died a mortal's death. Who knows how many metaphysical laws were, were broken when that happened. The, the living God, the source of life, became subject to death. The one who never dies, died. But what Christ's death means for us, there's a bunch of things that we could, we could talk about. There's just a, just a few for us to chew on today. God doesn't defeat death by going around it, but by going through it. Jesus could have come down to this world and never died. He could have just lived for thousands of years. And maybe that would have been a good way to defeat death. No, that's not the way it happened. He didn't defeat death by bypassing it. He defeated death by going through it himself. And here's something that's also counter to the way we would want to go through things. We like to bypass suffering, difficulty, and just anything that's unpleasant. We'd rather just avoid it. But God doesn't work that way. God goes through it. So when Jesus tells us to take up your cross and follow me, he's not telling us to go around our problems our difficulties. He's saying, I want you to go right through them. I want you to aim for that center and go right through it. And I'm going to be with you. We'll get into more of this on Easter Sunday when we celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. In verses 14 and 15 of what we read today, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Because Jesus died, death is no longer anything to fear. It might be awful and unpleasant and something that we don't like, but we don't have to be afraid of it anymore. Maybe, maybe you've had to teach your kids how to swim before and one, one way to do that that's maybe a tried and true way is, is uh, maybe they're standing on the dock or on the edge of the pool or something and they're saying, I don't, don't want to go in. And so you say, well, watch me. And you jump in. See, look, I'm, I'm okay. Why don't you come in? And, and they're, they're still a little nervous, but, but because you went in first, they think, well, maybe it's okay. You know, he, he did it, and he's still okay. Mom is still okay. Dad's still okay. Maybe I'll do it too. Well, that, that, that'd be kind of like us with death. Jesus went through death and then came out on the other side and said, Look, see, nothing to be afraid of. And it wasn't like he had just an easy death or anything either. Pretty much any other death would be better than his. He said, but he went through it, right through it, and he came out on the other side and said, look, see, nothing to be afraid of. So we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. In fact, our fear of death comes from being too attached to our life, to, to this life, to the here and now, to, to, to this world, the things that we have to the way thing that we want, the way we want things to be. We become attached to ourselves, really. And our, our fear of death is that we, we have things the way that we want them and, and, and the thought that that could be taken away from me. 
But the more we surrender our life to Christ, the less we will fear death. If we surrender our life to the Lord, if we seek to follow Him, then we won't be afraid of death anymore. So as far as we are afraid of death, the more we need to say, Lord, take my life. My, my life is yours. It's not mine. I, I'd like to hang on to it. I, I'd like it to go a certain way, but, but no, it belongs to you. You do with it as you like. And both for Jesus and us, salvation comes through death. We would rather go around it, but as Jesus demonstrated, no, the answer is going through it. As it says here in the passage we read, or no, not, excuse me, not um, the reading that you have today. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We are justified from our sin by Jesus' death. Because, because, I mean, sin might not sound so bad to us, but, but sin in reality is terrible. It can't be just, well, I'll just, I'll just write that off. I'll just forget about it. No, sin is too bad to ignore. So, in order for us to be right with God, there has to be a sacrifice. There has to be the shedding of blood. And Jesus made that happen. We are justified by his death. If Jesus didn't die, we'd still be in our sins. But in addition to that, we are sanctified from our sins by our death to self. So that, again, we have to put to death our earthly nature, our sinful nature. We have to put to death our ambitions and desires and offer them to God. So it's human nature to cling to life as ours. It's Christ-like to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as it says in Romans 12.1. That's what we're here for. Being a Christian means to die to this life to gain another one. And your Bible readings this week will go into that more. But here's, here's a thought to leave you with. Jesus Christ's mission in, in this life, and he walked among us, was to die so that he would be raised to life. What if that were our mission also? What if our mission wasn't to, to live our lives, but to die to live for God. Not sort of dying to ourselves, but actually killing off anything that gets in the way of following Jesus. What if that's what, was our, what our mission was? Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Our dear God and Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for conquering death for us, something that we could not do on our own. And Lord, in the way that would be completely counterintuitive to what we would expect or, or hope for, but Lord, we pray that we would follow you through good times and bad, whether it's easy or unpleasant, and that, Lord, our hope would be in you and not in our own solutions. And we pray that we would surrender our lives and ourselves so that, Lord, we could live a new life in Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen.